It is not unusual to find data sets from websites that are available to download as spreadsheets in various formats. The next part of this lecture notebook discusses how we may be able to read and write data to files if you were able to download such files first and then upload them to Colab. An alternative, which I show below, is to simply load the files directly into a notebook in Colab. Of course, you may still want to write the data to file, in which case the steps shown in Part B of this lecture notebook are still necessary. This just helps us save some time and steps in getting the data we want ready for analysis. However, this option is not always available. It depends on the data file, uh, if the data file is viewable in a certain manner of speaking from the web page. This provides a nice transition to the last part of this notebook. As a first example, we consider the data files present in the U.S. Elections Project involving voter turnout. Now, these appear to be embedded in their web pages as tables, but they need to be accessed directly through the available Google spreadsheets that are linked to on those pages. So if you follow this initial link, you'll be taken to this page where you'll see that you have this table where you can access other links that take you to general or primary election data for various years. If you click on one of them, you might have to then click on another link to get to a page like this, and it looks like there's a table of data here. And so if I look at this table, this seems like something that I could read in with Pandas Read HTML. So in fact, if I take that website, so I'm showing it here, this Elections Project Org um, website, and if I take that as the URL, that string variable set to that URL, and then I try to read in a list of data frames, it'll say no data frames are found. No tables are found. So there's no data frames to make from this. And you look at that and go, well, there's clearly these tables there. But this is related to also what we saw in activity two above, where there's certain types of embedding of the content that is just not readable in the read HTML um, method, by the read HTML method. However, the web page provides a link to a Google spreadsheet. So actually, if you come here, you'll notice that there is this direct, direct link to a spreadsheet provided right here. And if you click on that, you'll see that it opens up this Google Doc. Now, in this form, if I take the URL for it, and I take that as the string variable, and I set this in as now read HTML for the, uh, the URL, so as a variable for pandas read HTML function, um, then when I look at the data frames, you'll see that I created two data frames. What are in these two data frames? So the first one, you see, seems to have all this data. So I'll just kind of scroll up here. Excuse me, there we go. You can again make this if you want. Notice there's a lot of information here. Um, I think it's actually at the bottom. You can kind of make that interactive table. The second uh, table that it reads in is just something that's from the very bottom of the table that has, uh, I guess, no additional information. I'm not quite sure where that one came from. But that's sometimes what happens. There's two data frames. This one is meaningless as far as we're concerned. Now here's all the data that you'd want. So now this has data, right? This has all the data that we'd possibly be interested in, or at least that's available to us from this website, at least to the 2022 uh, election that just occurred. And so you can see that there's, maybe this is preliminary turnout. I didn't really analyze this data so much. I'm just using this as an example, but you could certainly go through and analyze this data and try to figure out how you want to maybe edit the data frame in terms of what kind of columns and rows you'd want to keep in order to do some analysis and possible some other changes. So that's just one way I wanted to show that even though I couldn't read in the data from this table, if I if the t data is available as a spreadsheet, like on a Google Doc, I can read that in. That's the point of that first example. Here's a second example. I'm going to show some stock price data available in an Excel format from a GitHub repo. And I found this by just doing a Google search for such data. I literally have no idea what this is going to show. I provide the link here. Um, you know, assuming this GitHub is still active, I just see this, this link. And so I look at this and I go, okay, I have to maybe view it in raw form, but it was kind of big and I couldn't do that. So it's just something that won't display in GitHub, but it's clearly an Excel spreadsheet of some sort of data according to some sort of stock. So if I try to do that, if I say, well, let me take this, this link to this data file and, the, or excuse me, the URL, and I set that as a new variable, I say, okay, let me read in that data. So it just takes a second to say, oh, it says no tables found. And it seems like, okay, well, there's a table found there, but maybe I can't read in an Excel spreadsheet using read HTML. Maybe I need to use the read Excel 
it seems like that should work, but this won't work either. So if you look at this, you go, oh, th there's a value error. The Excel file format cannot be determined. You must specify an engine manually. I looked this up. I said, what, what's the, what is this? Is there actually an engine problem? I provide a link here. You can read about um, the engines in terms of the read Excel. Like, do you have to specify certain ways of reading in certain types of files because Excel file types have been updated over time because of different versions of Excel? It turns out there's, it's not an engine problem. What I figured out by Googling the question was that if I look at the URL, if I add this part to it, this, this part at the very end, that um, it, that it, the question is, do I want the raw data? The answer is yes, so I want to set raw true. So basically I had this question mark for raw equal true. And if I set that in there for the URL, and then I look at the data table, the data that's read in, now this is data read in. It's not a list of data frames. It's reading in an actual data frame from an Excel spreadsheet into this data frame. And if I look at that, now you see there's this data and you see all these Chinese characters and it's a really big table. There's 6,935 rows. There's 12 columns. I have no idea what any of these things mean. Um, if you look at this uh, repo and you click on this link, it appears that this is um, perhaps a Chinese user that's looking at forecasting some sort of stock price and maybe it's on the Chinese uh, stock index. I don't know. I'm just using this as an example again that the main point of this is if you come across an Excel sheet, um, an Excel data sheet that's available on a web page to, uh, to look at, you can get the URL for that Excel spreadsheet. And if you just add this raw equals true, like a question mark raw equals true, that's another way to read in the data. And you can just use this read uh, Excel instead of read HTML. So that's kind of it. I just want to show some ways where I can also read in data di directly from a file available on a website into pandas but that leads us nicely into this last part of the notebook about reading and writing data to files and i'm going to start by writing data to files and in colab and then we'll also talk about how you would read them and load the files uh, into colab directly and this would be based on you having access to a file that you are is stored on your local machine and how you would handle it in this environment There are several tools available for reading and writing data to files, including but not limited to these popular options. Some basic I.O. and Python, Pickle, Pandas I.O. options, and SciPy's I.O. options, in particular SaveMat and LoadMat, which are particularly useful when you're doing more computational science. Uh, I've used those quite a bit in my um, experience doing some research. Below, we show some typical use cases of just a few of these with some code comments. Now you should really experiment and think here. Make your own activities. You should, but it is not required for you to, make at least one of your own activities that you also solve in this part of the notebook. An implicit suggested recommended activity for you is to expand and add onto the comments you see below in code or in markdown cells. Read through the documentation and try out different options that you also comment on, again, in code or markdown cells and perhaps even create some markdown cells that try to explain the pros and cons of the various methods, scenarios where you may prefer one to another, or anything else that you think is useful to comment on. Because this is really about you. Maybe you already have experience working with various file formats containing data. Maybe you do not. Either way, think about the file types you may need, will encounter, or have encountered. This may require you to ask some professors, students, professionals you know, etc. so that you can get a good feel for what you may work on someday. Or try searching online for what file types people typically deal with in practice. You can use some of the documentation and things discussed and linked to in this notebook as a starting point for your searches. We start with the basics. We will show the basic way of opening, writing, and reading a file's contents assuming the file contains the basic data type of strings. Check out the link for the basic I.O. and Python for some more details. We will quickly see, though, that there are some annoying limitations to this approach. So the first thing I'm going to use is the built-in open function, which does not require any import call. So there's no library required for me to import in order to open a file for writing. So what I'm doing is I'm going to open a file called Broncos Players, and I'm going to write the data in there based on the Broncos Players roster data that I imported and created a data frame for in the first part of this notebook. Now, 
this is giving the file name, this first argument, Broncos players. And this W right here is saying, I want to put this, I want to make this file, I want to open it in write mode so that I can write data to it. Now, doing this will delete any data that may already exist in a file if that file was already previously created with that name. So you better be careful about opening a file with the W command if that file already exists and you wanted to preserve the data. This is not what you want to do then because you're going to just erase all that data. So first I'm going to run this. Now you can say, where was that file created? If I come over here to this files command, you'll see that there's a file, Broncos players. And if I click on this, if I try to open it, let's say, can I even open it? I think I have to double click. There we go. You'll see there's nothing in that file. It opened it over here on the right hand side. There's just, there's just blank. It's just a blank file. So I'm going to close that, come back down here. And so we've run that. We went to the files icon on the left and we said, we saw that it was just an empty file, right? We see the file, but there's nothing in there. So now let's say we go to the data frame and we actually write the players names in there. So we can write strings to this file, but other variable types, even if those variable types are objects that contain strings, are problematic. So we can only write strings. Now, if we look at the player names we try to write, you're going to see an error. This is argument must be string, not a series, because the data frame, each of the columns is made up of something called a series of data. It's a pandas data type. So this won't work. Which what we need to do though, because that series contains the string variables of all the different players' names, is we need to loop over the contents of that series. So the way we do that is we look for, let's say, the name in the college in, and then we do a zip of the here I'm just showing with the Broncos player in college because I, I just want to show that now it makes sense. You would add the player in the college they play. That's usually information that's presented about a player. Uh, if I zip those two things together, then I create an iterable object that I can loop over and I can take the name in the college and then I can create a string variable that says name and then it puts the name variable from the corresponding iterate that I'm iterating over for the Broncos player as well as the college, right, which is the second thing that I'm uh, grabbing from this tuple that was defined by the zipping. And then I write that variable into the file using the dot write command associated with the file name, which has been assigned to this variable f. So I open this file, I assign it to the variable f, and I can do f dot write, but I can only do f dot write to string type variables. And so if I have a data type that contains string variables, then I'll need to loop over the contents to create individual strings that I can then write into the file. So now, there we go, I've written it. There's no error, but let's say I go back in here I open this file and you look at it and you go, well, that sure looks blank. I don't see any file. I don't see any names over here. This all looks completely empty still. Okay. What's going on? Why does it appear empty? We haven't closed the file. We actually have to use the close method associated with this file object, which is, you know, assigned to this variable name F. We basically instantiated a file object. It has methods like dot write or write associated with it that we access through the dot command and close. So once we close this, this prevents more data from being written to this file by accident. And it also allows us to view the contents. So now if I do F dot close, and again, that's a method. So it has those uh, parentheses there. If I now come over here and I click on this information on this file name and open it, you'll see here are all the names and the colleges for all the players on the roster. So that's it. It's now available for us to view. And you might notice, by the way, I'm able to write this. I haven't loaded or I haven't mounted my Google Drive. This is all written in an area that's kind of temporary storage for this uh, Jupyter Notebook. If I was to disconnect, delete the runtime, if I was to stop this file, this uh, this would just disappear. This this file wouldn't exist anymore. So that's something to realize. Um, now, if I look, by the way, the file, the variable name still exists for F, like this object is still instantiated. But if I say F dot closed, not close, closed, this will check if the file is closed. And it says true. So that's just a way to check if you've opened up lots of files and you're managing writing content to them. And you say, did I close that file? Did I make sure to close the content so that all the, the, the information was written to that file in memory and it was accessible? This is true, which means now if I go to that file to view its contents and it's all there, um, what does that mean if I try to read the contents back in? 
Well, if I try to read the contents back in so that I can maybe access it, maybe I deleted the data frame or whatever this object, I say, well, that's okay. I stored the name, the college in this file object. Let me just read that, that information back in. You'll see, oh, well, you can't do input-output operations on a closed file, which means you need to reopen the file. Now, in this case, I do the same thing. I say, well, I want to open that file, but I want to open it in the read format. So if you have a file already open, or excuse me, that exists already, and you say, I would like to open up the contents and view them, you do not open it with that W with the write because that will delete all the contents. You open it with the R right here so that it's in a read format. So I can do that. Now I can read the contents, and I have a yuck comment here. Why do you think that is? Because here's how it looks when I read it. It's a single string. It's a single long string. And you see it has these uh, backslash ends everywhere for new line commands. So this is just read in as a big string. So this is not great. And if you want to read this, if you, say, if you run that command again, what happens? It's an empty string. So what's going on here? When you read the data from a file, it is keeping track of where it stopped reading, kind of like an internal bookmarking of the data. So if I say, well, basically tell me, this is the tell command here, uh, the tell method, tell me where this bookmark position is, it'll say 2,165. And what does that mean? That's, that's effectively like what character, what, where did it finish reading in this data? So if I want to change the files ob the file object's uh, bookmark position, then I need to use the seek method. And then I provide an offset and whence parameters. Offset is how far off from a reference point defined by what the whence you want to set this position. A whence value of zero sets the reference point at the beginning of the file. One uses the current file position and two uses the end of the file as the reference point. I had to read the documentation to figure this out. Whence can actually be omitted because it's defaulted to zero, which means that if you just provide f.seq with a single value, then you're saying, how far off do you want to be from the beginning of the file? And that's exactly what I'm doing here. I say, okay, f.seq zero. I want to, I want to seek my, I want to seek the information at the very start of the file. That's what this will do. And then if I say, tell me where it's starting from after that, it's starting zero. That's basically the zero position to zero index, the very beginning of the file. And now if I say read lines, so now it knows when I'm reading lines that this backslash in is a new line character. So it knows it knows how to interpret that. And if, when I read lines, then the input is a list or what's produced is a list where every single line is then presented as its own string character. So this could allow you to loop through and print the contents of this list, and at the end of each one, it would you know pr produce a new line. If you're doing that, it prints with the with these uh, with these contents. And then finally, we can close. So f dot close. Okay. Now this data, right? It looks incomplete because we've only we haven't included like the player positions in it as well. This would be a nice data file that has player names, their colleges and what positions they play. So how can we add the player position data to the end of each line? So right, this is this is getting to an issue with this whole system here. There is no way to insert into the middle of a file without completely rewriting it. Right? You have to reopen it in that right format. It's going to delete all the contents, and you'd have to go back to how you're writing the data and redo it so it also included this other information of the white, like their position of their wide receiver, linebacker, quarterback, whatever it is, before it went to a new line. So it's just it's just kind of a pain. And this is not a Python thing, by the way. This is an operating system thing. It is the same in all languages. So the problem with open is that you can open a file in write mode, but it just wipes the data clean. It needs to be rewritten. This is worth reiterating. Read mode will allow you to view but not edit the contents. A read write mode allows you to read the contents as you write, but you can only overwrite existing data and not insert it in place. Or you can append data at the end of the file. You can do that. No good options with just an open exist for editing lines of data in place that do not simply overwrite the existing data. So there are some workarounds, but it's a little hacky. We're not going to dwell on this further. We will simply leave this as a suggested activity for any student that's interested for inserting the position data for each player in this data file. Nice thing to try on your own if you're interested. Um, but I want to move on to the use of Pandas IO options. And I suggest you read a bit more about saving data types more complicated than strings and potentially with more complex uh, structure using JSON and Pickle. So I have some links here. 
But I just wanted to show you some basic I.O., where the files are here. And it, if you wanted to preserve these, what you really should do is download the file. That's a very important thing. Download that file. Otherwise, you could just come, it'll, it'll be lost over time. Um, so if you wanted to keep this, you should download it. But we're going to go over some other I.O. as well. But that will be in the next part of this video. So now we talk a little bit about Pandas I.O. options. Some key points. If data is already in a Pandas data frame object, then that object has several attributes, method attributes, to write the data into files with various formats, including comma-separated values, CSV files, and Microsoft Excel formats. Data can also be read in directly to a data frame object using various methods available within Pandas. Basically, if working with data in a panel format, a data frame type object, makes the most sense to you, then the Pandas options are probably the best and easiest for you to use. So as a simple example, the data frame for the Broncos data that I have, I can write it to a CSV file as simply as just using dot two underscore CSV or to an Excel file. And note, you can describe an Indian as either XLS, which I believe is the older format for Excel files, or XLSX, which is the newer format for Excel files for newer Excel um, versions available from Microsoft. So I run it. That's it. These files are now created. And if we go open to this files, then we see here, we see the Broncos player. This was the uh, the data file that I wrote that just had the string data associated with it. And then I have this roster data and then also in the Excel format. So this is the CSV file and this is the Excel file. So they're, they're available. And now I could download them and have them on my computer. I could email them to somebody else. Uh, I could move them to my Google Drive. Uh, I, you know, I could mount my Google Drive first to then have access to it. But I have those options. Now, a CSV file is all in text format. So we can read it in as a file with open, but why would we do this? So again, if I open that Broncos roster data uh, file, this a CSV file, and I say read the lines, here it is, right? There's all the, like that first column, which has all the column names. There's like player, position, everything. Then the next lines, there's that numbering. This is just an awful looking way to read it in. What you, and I'll just go ahead and so I'll go ahead and close that because yeah, let's not do that anymore. I can instead read in the date, like directly to a data frame from CSV. And so it's as simple as using pandas built-in method, read underscore CSV. And then I give it the CSV file name and there you have it. I now have read in this data frame. And if you look at it, the one unfortunate thing that's a little annoying is that there's two columns of zeros, ones, and so on. Can you explain what happened? It's It has something to do with, um, it's not expecting these values necessarily to have been written to begin with. So the fact is it's just, it's just numbering the rows. And if I keep repeating this procedure of now writing this data frame to file and reading it in, I'll just keep adding more columns of the same on the left, which is a little annoying, but there's ways to get around it. But that's a good activity for you to try to figure out. It's not as complicated as you might think, but it does require you to do a little bit of reading on the source files and just see how to, what the workaround is. You could also post on Canvas and I'm happy to help out there. To read a data frame, let's say from the Excel file, I use the read Excel um, method, which we've seen before. I, I was showing that in terms of reading in data from a website directly that had an Excel spreadsheet available for download or reviewing. And you can, so you can give it a URL that's associated with an Excel spreadsheet, in which case you want to give like that question mark raw equals true at the end of the URL, or I just give it the, the file name. And again, when I'm using these things, ever, these files are just here. They're located when I click on file right next to where sample data is. This is not, I have not mounted my Google Drive. This is just kind of a virtual space available before I mounted my Google Drive. So uh, it's just there. That's where I could open this up. I could just move files in here if I wanted. Uh, you notice this option here to upload to the session storage. That's what it's saying on this upper left right here. That set during the session, the, these data files are available. That's what's going on while I'm running this, these data files are available. So I, that's where I can move files in and out, but it's kind of temporary storage. But anyways, I, I did I already run that? No, I didn't. Let's run that line of code. And then you can look at this. This looks just like the original data frame. Of course, you'll notice again, it added the left um, column again. So that's again, something that you want to be aware of when you're writing, maybe you want to write the data without that left column that has the numbering associated with the data frame. So uh, with this, the numbering of the rows. So anyways, 
that is uh, using pandas. The next part of the video will be will discuss some uh, input I output options available with the SciPy package. In a data frame, there is an entry for each row and column within that data frame. Now, some data may be missing, but this is just like an entry of none in a sense. So there is always something there, even if it is a type of null data. However, in computational science, we often generate lots of different types of data in the form of arrays that can have different formats and data types in different shapes and sizes. And we also generate lots of metadata describing details of how the problem was solved. Taken all together, this means a data frame is not necessarily suitable to describe all the data we generate for a typical problem solved in computational science. Luckily, SciPy, which is the scientific Python library, offers some nice solutions to these types of problems where data may be solved in a .mat format, which may seem familiar to you if you've ever used MATLAB. In such a format, we use a dictionary, in other words, a dict data type, to associate each array of data with a particular name, a label. We mentioned dictionaries briefly in module two. These are basically keyword functions. Below, we first show what a dict is and then how to save and load files in a .mat format. So this is just kind of an arbitrary and silly example, but I'm gonna create these arrays. So I'm gonna have an array of integers, A, that has zero, one, and two in it. I'm gonna have this uh, list B. So B is kind of this very different type of thing. It's a list uh, that has a list with three elements in it that has two integers and a string. And then it also has an array uh, of three components in it. And then I'm gonna create C, which is just a float, right? So these are all very different types of data types. Now. I can create a dictionary and just label it A, B, and C, but maybe the A data is associated with something that has an interesting name that you want to put on here, like maybe it's I like you, and because your examples are very unusual is how you maybe want to you know, call the data A, B, and C. I'm just showing things in terms of how you can create different types of dictionaries, and then we know how to access the data in a dictionary. It's all based on the keyword argument. So I'm just showing that in case you've forgotten from module two. Uh, similarly for like that second dictionary, these keywords are now these like more descriptive, meaningless things. This is just a silly example. I like you because your examples are very unusual. So here is zero, one, two, you know, that's the, that A value. And then here's that B data and here's that C data, but they're keyworded by these string statements. So, okay, now I have these dictionaries. What do I do with them? I import the IO module from SciPy as SIO for SciPy IO. And now once that's imported, I use the save mat method associated with that. And I can just write some nonsense. Is this is just something file name that is called the nonsense data. And I can write my dict one or my dict two into my nonsense data one or my nonsense data two dot mat files. So when I run those, and then I again come over here, You'll see here's my nonsense data over here. It's just written and now I can download it to my computer. I can email it to somebody else. And then if I wanted to read it in, uh, yeah, I've saved mat, I load a mat file. This is loading that dot mat file. And I'm gonna fix the uh, spacing there. And so this would be my BS. Of course, BS stands for Bachelor's of Science. What else do you think it would mean? So I'm loading my BS into here and then I know this will look a little scary when I print my BS here. So when I look to print it, that looks kind of gnarly. It has a lot of uh, weird things going on with it. Um, but we can get back to arrays just looking at the keywords. So again, the keywords which are found um, here, we could see kind of what the keywords are here, A and B. It's just showing all the contents in there. Uh, you say like, oh, if I say A, hey, there's that array. That was from that first dictionary. But what if we have a lot of keywords and what if the data is very complicated and so that this output was just a mess and you didn't know what the keywords are? Well, guess what? You can just go ahead and look at the keys. So if you print the keys from this, this isn't the my BS2 one, it'll say here are the keys. And so you can just see here are the keys. I like you because your examples are very unusual. And so now I can then create like my new A by just accessing, this would just be like assigning that information to a particular variable. And so this is now loading A in as you might notice a list of the contents instead of um, as just as the array, 
which was accessible when I accessed it differently. So you have to just play around with this a little bit. It's just meant to show you things you might do with SciPy, uh, the SciPy IO. Now, a nice thing as well is a dict is an iterable object uh, that you can loop through like this. So for each key in the dictionary, you can like print the key and what the output is of that. And so this just shows you like, here's these keys that are kind of global information about the file. And then it's just printing out all the information associated with those keys. So there's the key and then also the contents associated with that key. So we end things here. I hope you did some of the suggested implicit activities in the section. This is a good part of the course to focus on asking your own questions and deciding for yourself what you need to focus on in terms of more of your efforts for understanding, because there's many directions we can go now as we get into more advanced topics, too many in fact, and I'll select some very important things for you to do, but I cannot possibly create an exhaustive list of what is important for you personally. The point is for you to explore, explore experiment, and learn, and most importantly, have some fun. Make this your own and do what you want. And don't forget to do the summary activity. Thanks for listening. One quick add-on before we go is I did want to show that I disconnected and deleted the runtime. And if you open that files thing again on the left, uh, and I, I've reconnected even, you'll see all those data files are gone. This is what I meant where it's just, it's just while the session's running, while you're connected to the runtime, the files are now gone. I never loaded my Google Drive and this reading writing is just putting the data files here. If you wanted to save them, you need to save them, like download them to your computer. Or once you mount your Google Drive, you could then move the files in there for safekeeping if you wanted. But I just wanted to emphasize that before we completely end the video. So again, thanks for listening.